Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. You should have an attitude of gratitude. Ever heard that phrase before? Maybe your parents said it to you, maybe a teacher at school, maybe an older sibling when they were trying to get something from you. You should have an attitude of gratitude. Now, is that wrong? No, you really should. But there's always a little something behind that statement that implies that if you aren't grateful, something bad's going to happen to you. And in theological terms, we call that a statement of the law. It has a condition. You should be grateful or else. So if you ask yourself today, why should I be grateful? Why should I have an attitude of gratitude? You might be tempted to think, well, that's just because that's what good people do. Don't you want to be a good person? After all, if you aren't a good and grateful person, your life might not go so well for you. There it is again. The law accusing me, threatening me with the consequences of my failure. Because who can be grateful all the time? That would be exhausting. I have to remember all of that. Especially if you believe what I said before from God's Word about everything in your life, including your life itself, is a gift. So that might even be a slight implication. You maybe don't really want to say it. After all, we don't want to sound too harsh. But that's the implication of the world when all we have is morality. Why should I be grateful? Well, because that's what good people do, and if good people don't do that, bad things will happen to you. But today in our gospel reading, Jesus gives us an early glimpse of what He has come to break out into the world, to remake, to redeem, and make new, something that He will complete fully later on in Luke but now He's given us just a glimpse of what this new world is like, a conditionless invitation to this attitude of gratitude. And it's done in the only way that it is actually possible to do that. All of the great gifts of this new world and life are given to you without condition, no strings attached. No slight implication of failure or punishment given freely by the virtue of another. Our setting in our gospel reading for this amazing new glimpse into this new world brings us to Jesus running into ten lepers. He's on his way to Jerusalem, which is significant. Because what he's about to reveal in this interaction here is a small taste of what he's on his way to do fully and completely at the cross and the empty tomb in Jerusalem. And as he's going, he's giving us little sneak, pre sneak peeks and previews of what is to come. The other thing that's important is to really understand what it meant to be a leper in biblical times. It was extremely horrible. Not just the disease itself, although that is horrible enough. Leprosy is a bacteria that attacks your body slowly. It attacks your nervous system. It attacks your muscles and your skin. Eventually, it can cause you to go blind, to lose parts of your body, and eventually you die. And it's highly contagious. Because of that, if you were found to have leprosy, you were exiled and cut off from all those you knew and loved and the life that you once lived. It separated you. It placed a great chasm between you 
and all of those who you hold dear. This is why that whenever Jesus is approaching them, it says, it makes specific mention that there are, they are at a distance away from Jesus, and they call out to Him from a distance. For if you were a leper, you had to make it known. You couldn't hide your shame or the pain of your disease. It had to be publicly stated so that people wouldn't come near you. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine not only suffering from such a disease, but be reminded of it every time somebody comes around? And the only reason that you begin to talk to them is so that they will not come near you. And on top of all that, people thought that if you had leprosy, it was because God was punishing you for something that you had done. So not only are you physically disgusting and you need to get away from me, but morally you're reprehensible as well. I don't want to come near you, not because I just don't want to get leprosy, all that's part of it. The other part is God is punishing you and I don't want to be anywhere near that. So this is where Jesus comes in. And these people, they've heard about Jesus at this point. He's been doing some pretty incredible things. And if you were living in a situation like that, you're going to go after any possibility of reprieve. And they believe Jesus can do it. And so they call out to Him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And then what follows is simple but amazing. His interaction with them is quite simple. The text merely says this, He sees them and speaks to them. Go show yourselves to the priests. He doesn't inquire about their situation. He doesn't ask them what they're going to do for Him. He doesn't give them any conditions about what they must do in order to be cleansed. He just speaks. He sees them and He speaks to them. Go show yourselves to the priests. Now, the reason they're doing that is the priests had to clear you as being clean before you could return to society. Now, they must have believed Jesus was powerful because they don't stop and say, hey, aren't you going to wave a wand or touch us or do something? They turn and go. And it says, as they go, they were cleansed. They all receive the gift merely from words from Jesus, and they were cleansed. Now, with the picture that I sketched out for you before, can you imagine the joy of being freed from that? Not only the constant pain and suffering that the disease itself causes, but you can go see people again. They can touch you. They can be near you. You can speak to them. Something other than I have leprosy, stay away. We all know how hard it was to be isolated in our recent time here in our country. Now imagine that, but in the context of leprosy and for much longer. It doesn't tell us how long they had leprosy, but it's a lifelong illness. So you can imagine the joy. Then something interesting happens. So all ten are cleansed, and they're all rejoicing that they are healed, but one, only one, recognizes where it came from and turns around and goes back to Jesus and falls on His face, praising God with a loud voice Right? When something like that happens to you, you don't keep it to yourself. Right? So last week, Marissa and I announced we were having a baby. It was very difficult for her to not tell people. And me too, because that's really joyous news. So imagine now that you're in this, in this situation where this lifelong disease that you thought doomed you to despair has been healed miraculously from the mere words of this man. You're not keeping that to yourself. You want to go tell all the people you care about the most. And yet one returns and gives thanks to Jesus. 
And there's something interesting that happens here. In English, it's harder to grasp, particularly with the translation of the ESV. There's two different Greek words here. In verse 14, when they're cleansed from the word that Jesus uses when He says to the Samaritan, your faith has made you well. The Greek word for when Jesus speaks to the Samaritan is sozdo, which means saved. You see, all received the physical relief of leprosy in this life from Jesus' words. But only the Samaritan received salvation, for he knew the Lord was here. And the only way he can turn around, we come to find out later, is through the gift of faith. That's the only reason we turn around and recognize and can see where our blessings come from. Faith is the only reason that you came here this morning. The way you can say, Jesus is your Lord, the way that you can confess your sins, not in despair, but in hope for the mercy and grace of Christ. And I hate to break it to you, but our situation isn't all that much different than the leper's. You see, Christ is going to Jerusalem, and He completes this task of healing, and now He has a similar interaction with you and me. And it's even simpler than His interaction with the lepers. He sees you diseased, separated from God, isolated, and speaks your sins the disease that binds you to death and fear, are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven, and you are cleansed at His Word. Maybe you've done some awful things, even awful by the world standards, but we've all done awful things. None of us are worthy of the attention nor words of Jesus, yet He sees us and speaks them. Your sins are forgiven. And as bad as leprosy is, it's got nothing on sin. So our joy is so full. Our gratefulness and faith is unreal. It's amazing. That's why we sing That's why we pray. That's why we sing His praises as often as we can in recognition of this amazing gift. See, in worship, you return to Jesus with words of thanksgiving. In case you haven't noticed today, but think about this every Sunday. Think about the words that you sing in the songs that you sing and the words of the prayers that are spoken on your behalf up here on the altar. They're words of praise and thanksgiving, of supplication and joy in this faith that we have that recognizes that Jesus isn't just some teacher performing miracles, but the very Son of God who who cleanses us of all our sins, no longer separated, but joyously returning to the home of God, welcomed into His kingdom as children. So what does all that mean? What does that mean for me today? It means that the invitation given from God to live as He intends are not given through Jesus with a legalistic threat. There's no implication that if you don't do this, you will perish. Jesus doesn't work that way. He sees you and speaks. Your sins are forgiven. doesn't matter which ones. He sees and speaks, and you are healed. But we see in the one, the response of faith, joyous, face-on-the-ground sort of gratitude for the one who has saved us. And now we, shall, now we see His call in our life differently. Giving thanks to God for all He's given us isn't something we're doing in order to be a good person. That illusion's been shattered. And now we know that it has nothing to do with us, but everything with Jesus and His Word. 
a grace given by His virtue and not our own. And that changes everything. No longer do I have to approach my life in worry that I have to live up to some standard that I myself set or that I perceive that God has set because Jesus doesn't work that way. He sees you, He has compassion on you, and He speaks forgiveness. And in faith, we turn in grateful devotion. That's what we're here to do, to receive the gifts of God through the eyes of faith, seeing them for what they are and returning thanksgiving and praise. Maybe you didn't know it when you walked in this morning, but you do actually have an attitude of gratitude, but not because somebody threatened you, but because somebody healed you from the worst sort of things imaginable and gave you the best in return. Today we're turning in our pledges. What a great example of something that we're tempted to see has some sort of threat attached to it. It does not. This is the house of our Lord Jesus, and here things are freely given and in faith received and returned in thankfulness and praise. It is our natural, grateful response of faith to the One who declared us saved by His Word this very day. Your sins are forgiven. It's a word He will speak to you as often as you are willing to hear it, whether it's through His Word in your daily Bible readings or through His called and ordained ministers on Sunday mornings in the church. Your sins are forgiven. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, go rejoicing. You've been healed. Your disease, sin, totally wiped away, cleansed. And your faith, given and sustained by the Holy Spirit, has saved you, has made you whole through the words and promises of Jesus. So today, let us simply rejoice and give thanks to God for the mighty and wonderful work of salvation He has done, is doing, and will continue to do in our midst. In the name of Jesus, amen.